to heaven or hell my name is ben copley and this is heidi zasser and uh we uh, are going to invite you all to call in and talk about the bible today uh we're going to try i think the last time we uh, may have not have picked up the phone we've there's a new system so we're going to try to watch for this flashing light and make sure that we answer phone calls this time if we may have missed your call last time um, but we do welcome your calls. Right. 215-2288. If you're out of the area, you have to dial the area code 865. We welcome any questions about the scripture. Um, we believe it's important to study the scripture uh, and know what God has for us. I mean, you know, I, I would say God wanted us to know something, didn't he? Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's an awful lot. Um, and I was thinking about the word gospel the other day, and I understand that the word gospel that is in the King James Bible comes from a word that means good news. Mm. Good news, and it's kind of funny because we call Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John the four gospels, mm. but we also talk about other books in the New Testament as gospels, right? But when I think of good news, I don't know, and when I read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, until we get to, you know, the fact that Christ dies on the cross, and now we know what that's about, I don't, I see good news as what the Apostle Paul preached. Mm -hmm. To me, good news is when we find out the benefits that we have obtained from the cross, what all that means. Right. Yeah, I mean, if you look at what Peter's preaching in Acts um, chapter 2, he's not... I mean, it's within what he's preaching. Definitely, the gospel is there. But uh, what he's saying to to Israel uh, there in Acts two uh, is more like uh, an indictment of their guilt, and um, you know, and Paul, you know, Paul even does that in a way. I mean, in the first parts of uh, the book of Romans, he just shows how. Um, degenerate and how needful we are of some type of salvation you know how oh, uh, sure. filthy that we are and I mean in order to, to to show somebody that what salvation is you have to first show them that they need salvation and that with that comes uh, showing their guilt um, absolutely you know. and I would say that applies to both but when I read in the Gospels Matthew Mark Luke and John I think of things like Matthew 520 where Jesus says, For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Right. Or what he says to the young lawyer, what saith the command you know, what saith the law? Mm -hmm. You know, you had to keep the commandments to be saved. Right. You know, so when I see that they all turned away dejected and you know right. to me it's like mm, that's not nearly as good news as the mm. good news hey With Christ came and paid for all our sins right. he died he was buried and he rose again the third day all you have to do is believe this right. you know trust in what he did for you and you said that's to me that's much better news than right. keep the law <laughs> right and you know <clears throat> to be righteous one must keep the law uh, there the law has to be kept for somebody to have righteousness. Now the thing about it is, you mean today you in the age of keep grace? Righteousness? Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. no. no, no. And the thing about it is, even back then, it was impossible for somebody to keep the law and right. attain righteousness. That right. was just wasn't something that was concluded and in, included in the the gospel yet. But anybody that that had faith knew that they had sin that they hadn't kept up with. Um, that that there was there was still an issue even if they were the most um, zealous sure. uh, you know law abiding uh, believer but right. that there was still an issue with sin that they they needed some type of help and that's where the sacrifice came did um, you say they knew that well I mean the believer would know that there's mm -hmm. I mean that, you know even David I mean David's a good example of it you read in Romans chapter uh, four uh, David says, uh, blessed is the man whom God uh, does not impute sin. Right. Uh, he knew that there was uh, some issue with his right. sin uh, that he couldn't deal with through the sacrifice. Right. And, right. Um, but he didn't know, uh, he didn't know that, that Christ was going to pay for the sins of all men. Um, but he knew that some way, somehow, God would deal with it mm -hmm. uh, for him, and you know, because what you know, what did David do? He he had a man killed. 
and uh, he took he basically stole that man's wife, mm -hmm. and then he had the man killed because right. of it. So right. he didn't um, have to deal with the man, I guess. Right. And there was no there was no sacrifice for right. what David did. Right. So according to law, David, what should David have? Well. I know what, David. What should have happened David, to David? David knew there wasn't a sacrifice that would cover his sins. What should have happened to David according to the law? Uh, he should have been punished eternally, separated from God. Right. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that's an amazing thing. David is a great example for us in Scripture. But, you know, I still think the law is a stumbling block, you know, it is. for a lot of people. And I know the entire nation of Israel, you know, Paul's talking in Romans 10, verse 1, and he says his heart's desire for and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. And you use the word zeal, which is why this came up in my mind. But for I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. And, you know, here this is plainly in the scripture, been in the scripture for thousands of years, um, but people are still stumbling over the law, trying to establish their own righteousness, to be good enough, mm -hmm. to do enough good, to, you know, obey commands that are here in the scripture, clearly scriptural commands, mm -hmm. you know, but they, aren't recognizing that there's a change. Isn't that correct? Right. And that, you know... We that the cross happened. Uh, that the cross happened. Right. And that there's a, you know, and people will say, oh, no, no, that sign out in the yard that says keep the Ten okay. Commandments, I, I don't mean that for yourself. Somebody would say possibly, yeah. I don't mean that for yeah, your salvation. But really, they, they do. And even if they don't, if they just say, just keep the Ten Commandments, Commandments, so you act good, so that you, you know. And there's, you know, the the Paul says that the the commandments are good and holy. There, there there's nothing wrong with the commandments. There's nothing wrong with the idea of, you know, uh, love the Lord thy God, with honor thy mother mm -hmm. and thy father. Thou know, shalt not steal. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Commit adultery. You know, there's nothing, absolutely nothing wrong with that. Paul says that all those things are summed up in one one saying, though, mm -hmm. "Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself." If 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 you um, under, have an understanding about uh, Christ and what He did on the cross, and you trust His death as a payment for your sin, um, and then you've basically fulfilled uh, the first five commandments. Um, you know. Thou shalt right. not use the Lord's name in vain. Thou shalt um, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and mind. Um, keep remember the Sabbath day. Keep it holy. Uh, you, you basically have you've kept all. The, you, you understand that God is God, and He provided you a sacrifice, and you love Him and thank thank Him for it. Now, the the rest of the story is though. Your witness before men. Now shall love thy or honor thy mother and father. You know, not you know, not covet not their covet. wife, their manservant, right. their maidservant, their so, ox. There, yeah. And so all those things are summed up in this one saying: Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Right. Sure. And if you love your neighbor, then you're going to understand. I don't. I don't need his wife. I don't. I don't need to lie to the guy. I don't need to steal from the guy. I don't need to do any of these things. And that's, I mean, how hard is that really to understand? Right. I mean, that's, you know, nature really tells you that it's not right to steal and it's not right to, to lie right. and to kill and all those things. Right. Um, and so, you know, this, we were read, read this verse here. This is the way uh, really that you deal with your behavior. Romans chapter 8, we read this um, earlier, me and Heidi were talking about this. Um, we'll start in 8.11. Um, it says, But if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, He that raised up Christ from the dead shall quicken your mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwelleth in you. <clears throat> Um, therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to live in the flesh, live to the flesh, uh, 
debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. Okay, so basically in, in 12 it says, <clears throat> Now that you're saved, if the spirit of him that raised up Christ Jesus from the dead dwell in you, are you supposed to live your life the same way that you did beforehand? The, absolutely In the same not. thinking, yeah, the same confusion, right. the right. same... Um, Even in the same sin, like Romans 6, 1, God forbid, you know, right. what shall we say? This is, we this is uh, God calls you to a repentance, basically. Right. And that is a, a change in the way that you think about things. Yeah. And it says, this is what this verse says, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. That was what was going to happen to you before you got saved. Right. There was no other choice that you had except to live after the flesh. And what was going to happen to you? You're going to die. Yeah. You're going to you're going to reap corruption all of your days. If you never mm -hmm. did trust yeah. in Christ's death, you're going to die. And you're going to die in the lake of fire for the rest of eternity, basically. Mm -hmm. So you're saying you'd be spiritually dead while you walk, right? And eternally dead when you die. When you die. Okay, okay. so there's that's what happens before you get saved. Right. And so, therefore, brethren, we are not debtors to the flesh. The flesh here is an example of what you were before you got saved, and what you are in your body, what you're, you know, uh, who mm -hmm. you are in this life, basically. Uh, but you're not debtors to that. That the flesh is not what paid for you, mm. not what gave his son for you. Uh, it says, "For if you live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live." And that means, if you count that flesh to be dead, basically, you see it as death. It was death before you got saved. Your body's going to go and it's going to die. There's nothing good that's going to come out of that body, the body. Right. And so you just say, I can't rely on the body or my flesh mm -hmm. to make the good decisions that I need uh, to make. Because, you know, even though nature teaches us it's not right to kill, it's not right to steal, or bear false witness, to covet, to commit adultery, even though the law tells us those things, the right. flesh desires those mm. things. It desires. When it does something wrong, it wants to lie about it so that the person doesn't find out about it. And, uh, you know, when you see something that you like to have, mm. you'd like, man, I would really like to have that. I wonder if that mm -hmm. guy would know or know it was right. me if I went and just took it from him or, you know. Or even if you don't take it from him, if you covet the item. Right. Yeah. Well, that's what, I mean, it yeah. says you shall not kill, steal, bear false witness, right. covet. Commit adultery. I mean, and, and even committing adultery, that's mm -hmm. covetousness. I mean, that we were talking about David a minute ago. Mm -hmm. What of those five things did David commit? All of them? All of okay. them. That was a good guess, he, wasn't he it? He lied about it. Yeah. He, he, First, he, he lusted after he, her, coveted her from coveted the porch. Her. Yeah. He, adulter he was adulterous. Yeah. Uh, he killed somebody. Yeah. Uh, I mean, David was guilty of all those things. Right. So... Um, you know, I guess that the point is that what it, what it says here now in the gospel, because that's what we're talking about, right. is the gospel something that can actually do something about your flesh, about the deeds. It says, if if, but if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. Okay, mm -hmm. and that's something different than that you were doing prior right. to your salvation, and that's living. Uh, growing, uh, and you know, we were talking about that earlier. Once you get saved, you know, you begin to live, and it never really ends. Even right. though you're right. you're gonna you know decease one day, you're gonna you're actually gonna die yourself. Um, what's gonna happen to you the moment that you finally do just you know go unconscious? You're gonna mm -hmm. wake up, and it's like you were just dreaming right. Right. in a way. <laughs> So um, it, it, it's just a different, op it's a different. It we should operate differently because he lives, he, what is that verse that it says? Um, he gave his life to us mm -hmm. so that he could live. I don't know if that's through. a verse. Well, it said something and then, and in you all. But anyway, he did, he, he did. He gave his life for, to, he for gave, us mm -hmm. so he might give his life to us, that he might live, live through us. Lives. So that he could through live us. through us, right. yeah. And you know, 
you, this verse just, this word just kind of jumped out at me because I was thinking this idea before we came. In Romans 8, 12, you said, we are debtors. Mm -hmm. And you know, we always say, you know, there was a debt, I had a debt I could not pay. Christ paid the debt he did not owe, mm -hmm. you know, but I'm gonna go to 2 Corinthians 5, and I just love this passage. 2 Corinthians 5, 14, we are debtors, he did pay it all. We are saved and sealed the moment we trust in what he's done. But 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15 says, for the love of Christ, his love, his love, just like Paul says, I beseech you by the mercies of Christ, you know, his love is for us, convinces us or constraineth us. For the love of Christ constraineth us because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. We were already dead. And that he died for all, that they, I'm gonna say we, that we which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. So we are debtors, his love constraineth us. It, it's like, you know, it's like, hello, wake up. You were dead. Right. You were dead. And if it hadn't been. You had been no hope. You had, absolutely. Um, and, so, and he died and provided you hope. And you know what? The thing about it is, though, it just transferred the debt. We owe him now, don't we? <laughs> well, it but we're saved it, and sealed. So I want to kind of take but we're, the. We're bought with the prize. We're bound. In fact, I want to talk about being bound. Does Paul, don't, don't all of his apostles say something about being his bond slave? Mm, right. Or they're but, bound by right. him. They're bound to do this. They're compelled. Mm. You know, they're forced. I mean, if Christ is living in you, there's a compulsion to get out and do the things that, you know, the Word of God is telling like us He wants us to do. Those things. They must do those things, yes. <laughs> okay, so I want to talk about being a bond slave. So you're saying, you're saying if you're saved, then then your whole frame of mind should change, just like Romans 12, 1, right. you know, be ye transformed by the renewing of your minds, be not conformed to this world, you know, and so it's really about our thinking, and it, there's a battle going on for our thinking. Right. And if we don't change our thinking, then we're not really, that, that love of Christ isn't constraining us. We're not really his bond slave or bond servant. There's something wrong, mm. yes? I guess the whole point is we're his, we're debtors, we're constrained, we're bond slaves out of gratitude out of gratitude mm -hmm. for well, what he's done what, you know, even Paul. That's the only reason we're debtors, what does out he of say, gratitude. Uh, woe unto me, let's see, what does he say there? First Corinthians, or Second Corinthians. Um, a dispensation of the gospel is committed mm -hmm. unto me. It says, woe unto me if I preach not the gospel. Yeah. Did Paul have a choice whether or not he was gonna preach the gospel or not? He said no, he was bound, he absolutely But not. the thing about it is, but physically, like everybody else, yes, he had a choice. He had a choice. He did, yeah. But the thing, what what happened, though, and see, Paul, even though, and you know, I think that even though Paul was persecuting the church before he got saved, mm -hmm. I still believe that Paul, when given the message, would have believed. When, it, when, because that's what happened. Christ, I mean, I know he's seen the shining light from the heaven mm -hmm. and everything. There was a big witness against, you know, yeah. to him. But that's why he received abundance of, of, of revelations is that I believe that Paul did have faith. I just don't know if he was ever, you know, he had the zeal. It says that he had a zeal. It was not according to, um, no, that was the Israel that had accord, not according but to But he was just it. like them. He was absolutely just like them. Right. They had a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. Mm -hmm. And he was a Pharisee, right? right. He, was Pharis uh, he was Pharisaical, you know? Right. So that's that zeal. Right. But uh, I just, you know, I, I, what, I guess what I'm saying, what I'm, what I'm thinking is, does a person go from no faith did Paul have right. absolutely zero no, faith? No, he had a faith him. in God. I'd say he had a faith in God. And then when God hit him with the light, is that when he just had this great faith? Or did, it, yeah, did no, he have no. the faith yeah. and then the gospel was given to him sure. and that faith produced fruit then? And then you, so Paul, I think he had this great faith beforehand. Mm -hmm. He just never really had been given the gospel, right. uh, never really had the opportunity, I guess, in a way. And that maybe 
that great zeal that he had right. is just being transferred, transferred over, over sure, to sure. that great fruit that he produced sure. while in his you know in his ministry right. so um, anyway um, yeah and that's a good point and I think that you know the Jews they were somebody they were called of God mm. they had the oracles you know they had the promises right, right? I mean you know they maybe were a little puffed up but hey they were somebody and they knew they were somebody and so then when Jesus comes on the scene and you know what is it about your own country your own people oh, never wouldn't, they wouldn't accept they it. never receive right <laughs> so you know and I think that's part of where the problem was with the Jews too but and we know clearly they stumbled at the stumbling stone mm, of right. the cross yeah they were they were really were super puffed up um, and proud, you know, and that was their office, I guess. I mean, mm -hmm. they, God, there was nothing special about the Jews when God called them out. They were just no, like you they and were, I. They were. Um, the only thing that the Jews were to do is to produce the Word of God. Uh, and along the way, uh, they there was a lot of history recorded about about them, and they and were the always seed itself, not just, just the word, but bad. the word. Yeah, right. The, they were always just as bad as every oh, country sure. around them, and it's the same with Christians today. I love the bumper stickers that say Christians are not better. Right. We're better off. I, I'm no better than some unsaved person. Right. It's just that I know where I'm going. I right. have peace with God. It's a peace of mind more it than is. it is anything. And that peace of mind, then, if you realize there's no good in my flesh, right. and I, only good is what God produces in me. That's yeah. what that verse was talk, that, talking about what we read there in Romans chapter 8. There's no good in my flesh. I count it to be dead. The only good that there is is what comes from God. He shall quit, you know, he's going to quicken you when you just start to think like that. Right. I can't produce good in myself. I can't produce good in my flesh. The only good that can be produced is through what Christ did on the cross for me. The spiritual blessings that he offered to me and give to me freely, those are where the good fruits lie. That's right. the only place that there is going to be life. And, you know, that verse there says that, uh, you shall live or you must live when you think that way that's how it's going to happen when you uh, are appreciative for the things that he's given to you for you know and some people think you're just a big you know you're a big sap yeah you know you talk about joy and, and love and you know the peace that passes all understanding and you know yeah, that's that's fine. Those things are those things are good. You know, I I wish I had. I, you know, I wish everybody actually had peace mm -hmm. in their mind uh, on this earth. But I I know what the mind does to people. I have one of my own. Yes. The mind is a, a horrible thing sometimes, and it races and is anxious, and you know it um, it's always um, trying to. Conf you know, there's always confusion about what's right and how to respond to things and what to do and, you know, uh, stress and, you know, workload, sure. kids, everything. So the mind, is, you know, God gives us, though, what? The the comfort, the God of all comfort shall keep your hearts in mind. Uh, it, it, he gives us consolation. And that's when you, when a person finds consolation in God and, and realizes that it's a free gift, um, it's a wonder pl wonderful place to be. Right. And when you start to appreciate that consolation uh, that he's given to you, uh, that's when um, it'll affect the way that you act, period, uh, yeah. in, in your body. Well, and not just appreciate. I say this all the time. We have two natures. When we're saved, we have two natures. We still have the old flesh. Right. And then we have the new nature, mm -hmm. you know, we have God's spirit living within us, but we are so caught up in feeding our flesh, you know, visually what we watch, what we hear, mm -hmm. you know, what we think already, just um, our basic needs. Our flesh occupies 100%. So now we get saved, we have this new nature. Mm -hmm. And if we don't feed the new nature, that old nature is going to keep us you know, you're saying we need to change our mind. We need to have a different perspective. But apart from the word of God, which worketh in them that believe, mm -hmm. I just don't think that new nature ever 
grows. You know, I, we start off as babes, you know, and Paul says, you know, I could only feed you milk. Mm. You know, you were yet carnal. And I think probably the majority of Christians get saved and sealed, and that's wonderful. That's wonderful. But we're never effective at ministering to other people. We're never that conduit of this good news, you know, because we don't get past our own infancy. Mm. We don't get to where, you well, know, you, we can crawl or sin. They don't even, you, it's hardly even, it's hard to even say it's an infancy. I mean, it is, but um, it, like you said, people get saved and, you know, that's it. That's it. Right. And so what, if there, if you got this, this mind that's, that, that's been <coughs> controlled by the flesh your whole life, you're, you know, 20, 30 years old, and you put this one little speck of truth inside there. Right. And like you said, it just gets covered up and squashed right. if there's no other Input. Dir directive, mm -hmm. you know. Right. And that's what this is. This is right. like, this is directions or instructions. Right. Uh, you know, uh, through through the Bible, there's many times where it says, you know, be like Him. Uh, you're gonna basically uh, let your mind. Uh, I see. Be conformed by, to the image of His Son. Yeah. Uh, the, the transforming your mind, the renewing of your mind. Mm -hmm. there, over and over again, it's a mind thing. It's a mind thing. It's a mind thing. To renew something is to say, I got this head that's full of fleshly knowledge, and I need to tear down, pick apart everything in the world that I've ever thought, so that this little seed has a chance to grow mm -hmm. uh you know that's what um what is that first second corinthians nine maybe let's see here if i can find it it's to uh, tear down all strongholds and the all vein, yeah ye, casting down the yeah second corinthians chapter 10 it says um uh, where do i want to start verse to, but I beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present with, uh, with that confidence wherewith I think to be bold against some. I should have started another verse ahead, but uh, I think to be bold against some which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. There's some in this church that are saying, "Oh, you can't, you know, don't listen to him. He walks according to the flesh too. He's got mad at you." And it says. In verse 3, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. That's uh, for our weapon, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, fleshly, but mighty through, through God mm -hmm. to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down what? Imaginations mm -hmm. and every mm -hmm. high thing that exalted this mm -hmm. itself against the knowledge of God. And bringing into the captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ and having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Uh, do you look on the things after the outward appearance? So what, what, is the, what is the word of God and the warfare about? Is it about a strife between... Two different religions. Uh, uh, you know, there's been the Crusades. You know, they went down there and they did all that stuff back in the medieval times. Is that what the warfare is? That the, the good fight? No. The the fight here says our for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through through God to the pulling down of of strongholds. What are those strongholds? Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge. And where do you keep knowledge? You keep knowledge in your head. Mm -hmm. uh, Ephesians chapter uh, 6 uh, let's see here like 10, the armor of God. Yeah. <clears throat> What's that? Galatians 6. Mm -hmm. uh, it says verse 12 or verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness in this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. 
Wherefore, take uh, unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand in, that, in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girded about with truth, and having the breastplate of righteousness, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, take out, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. See, there's this warfare that's taking place, and it's not it's not between you and that guy or you and that right. woman. It's it's about Satan and the warfare that he has against all humanity. And he doesn't want us to be out there sharing the gospel. And even if we share it with our mouths, he wants our lives to bring reproach to it. Right. So they're going to say, well, who cares what she says? And he, and he you wants know. there to be so many different things right. about God's right. word out there that there's such confusion. Right. Uh, but the, right. The, instead of it just being plain and right. simple, right. Christ died for your sin. He paid fully the sin debt that you owe. Right. All you have to do is trust in, in that information and you're saved. You don't have to pray. You don't have <laughs> to get down on your knees. You don't have to get baptized. You don't have to walk down the aisle. You don't have to walk down the you aisle. You don't have to talk to anybody. What you, about the profession of faith? I mean, Romans 10 says, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus mm -hmm. and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, Thou shalt be saved. Right. So, do you have to confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus to be saved? Um, well, <laughs> the thing about it is, is what we've been talking about. Um, I believe that that in chapter ten, what is? It's still where my heart's it's desire, my prayer for Israel is that they might be saved. It's well, part of that I think same. It's a, I think it's a. <sighs> It's an example of what's going to take place in a believer. When a believer gets saved, mm -hmm. he's basically, that is he's your bound, profession. He's bound to say it. Right. I mean, it, And Paul prayed for utterance for him, that, well, he, it, that he would open his mouth boldly. It's just like in Philemon when he says uh, in Philemon 6, um, that the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ. The mm -hmm. communication of thy faith becomes effectual That's good by verse. acknowledging it. How do you acknowledge mm -hmm. it? I say that Jesus Christ saved me. He paid the price that's that I owe. Mm -hmm. And that's... Is that that's what it? I believe that's what it's talking about there in Romans ten, where it says confession is made with the mouth. Do I confess the Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross and paid for my sins? <laughs> yes, yes, I do. Yes, you do. Do I have to confess every single sin that I ever committed? No, this just said confess. I just asked you about confess with your mouth. I know Jesus. it, but see the thing about it is though is people will look at that. And now it's a thing about confessing. Then they say confess in First John, right? And they think, oh, we still have to do that too. Right, right. And so what you know, what I say is this: I confess Him. There is no other hope that I have except that's in mm -hmm. Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. There's no other way for me to do it, unless I want to try to. Well, you know what? I already messed it up. I can't keep the law. I done messed it up. <laughs> yeah. Just today. I mean, every day, right? Well, I mean, yeah. And that's just the way that. It yeah. is in the flesh. Well, if I'm supposed to love my neighbor as myself mm -hmm. or, and love the Lord my God with all my heart, soul, mind, yes, I'm going to fail at that all the time. I mean, there's something innate in us as humans that still is me always, first, me first, me first. Well, I mean, even, even in that, do you always make the best decisions Never. for yourself? <laughs> for yourself? Oh, even for yourself? No, probably not. Probably not, do you? See, that's the one thing about that verse that's kind of interesting to me. Love thy neighbor as thyself. No man hateth his body, but loveth and cherishes it. Right. But the thing about it is, you are never going to be able to love yourself in a way that's beneficial unless you're loving yourself according to the, the riches of the grace of of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Father. That's the only way that you're going to love yourself that's a yeah, It's not a message we hear very often, but you're right. 
And, and it's I, not a message a, we we always hear the I other. I mean, when before you got saved, were you loving yourself uh, to enough to to have uh, life? And you know, uh, a, was your mind, you know, healthy and your body healthy because of the decisions that you were making? You know. Before you get saved, most of the time people are a train wreck, and they're not <laughs> loving themselves. Right. But so that verse says, "Love thy neighbor as thyself." When a person gets saved, they have to learn how that Christ loved them before they can really even start to mm -hmm. cherish themselves in the, the proper way. Have a, you know, like I said earlier, people just say, "Oh, you're such a sap." You talk about love and joy and peace. It is and about love. The it, thing about it is, though. If we Is have that, not love, we're what, like tinkling brass? I mean, right. worthless. And some people don't even care about those things. Yeah. Is that is that healthy for that person? No. I mean, no, it can't be healthy. To yeah. Yeah, I mean, if you're going to have if you're going to have children and you're not going to love your children or yeah. love your mother and your father, or, you know, even love. I mean, people do some pretty degradate degrading things to themselves, even you know. Yeah. Uh, and people, you know. People get depressed and 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 way far off track, and um, you know that's that's unhealthy and un you know it, sometimes it leads to mm -hmm. bad depression, sorrow. You know, uh, people commit suicide all the time because they get in despair uh, so bad. Uh, so. You know what? Have you been watching this light? Whenever I you look at this, okay. <laughs> I've been trying to glance down there, but uh, I would have noticed if it lit up. Okay. You guys call in any time that you want to. We'll, if not, we'll just keep on rambling, I guess. But uh, <laughs> you know, it's just um, that. And that you know, the thing about it is, you're talking about the gospel when we first got started. Mm -hmm. All of this information was was hidden to those guys back in the Old Testament. They couldn't see. They, could, they couldn't know that Christ was going to die on the cross and pay for their sins. They didn't know that Christ, whenever he did that, he was going to give people the indwelling Holy Spirit where they could live based on those principles. It wasn't there. Mm -hmm. right. And that's, you know, that's part of the things that was kept sealed up and hidden uh, that, that people, you know, they searched for it, though. Right. They, they, you know, they knew that there was a better answer. They just couldn't figure out what, it, what the answer was. You know, the prophets, they, they searched for the grace which should, should afterward be revealed. Um, um, uh, let's see here. There's another verse that's like it, and I can't. I like it. We have an even more sure word of prophecy. Is that the one you? Uh, well, that's Hello. another one that goes along those mm -hmm. lines too. Um, and it's written down in the book. Yeah, we've got it. We've got the re direct revelation from the Lord Jesus Christ. But uh, you know, we we live in a great in a great time. The information age, and well, we've got all this information right here. Right. I mean, <laughs> you could have lived back in time past when yeah. everything was um, real obscure and veiled and and dark and and hard <coughs> to see through. Uh, but we live in an age today where. God has given us the the completed revelation, and you know the the it's called the hidden wisdom of God. Um, in yeah. in Philippians, or see, you know, Colossians chapter one. Uh, you know, to go along with what we just read there in Philemon six or Philemon verse six. Mm -hmm. um, in verse 3, it says, In whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom mm -hmm. and knowledge. And this is talking about the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ. In whom are hid all treasures of wisdom and mm -hmm. knowledge. And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. Let's see, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. I skipped a verse. Anyway, verse 2 is what I wanted to start at. That their hearts might be comforted being knit together in love unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding there's a there's a wealth of information and that you can be have a full assurance of what you know that it's truth that it yeah. and, and understanding and how do you do it like what it said there in Philemon 6 to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ. 
in whom are hid all treasures of wisdom and knowledge. In that mystery that you acknowledge are hid all treasures of wisdom and knowledge. You can obtain all riches of the full assurance of understanding, which is equivalent to those all treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And where are they at? They're in the mystery. That hidden wisdom of God that was kept secret mm -hmm. from ages and from generations, but now is made known to all his holy apostles and prophets. That that information that, you know, David did those things and he knew there had to have been something that God, somehow God was going to save him. Blessed is the man whom the Lord does not impute sin. Yeah. How could David say something like that if he knew, if he, if he, if he wasn't searching or groping yeah. for this, this information that we know now? That's what it says there in Peter. It says um, that the the prophets. Uh, they prophesied of the grace that should afterward be, be revealed. revealed. Yeah. They, they, they just, they, there was information that was kind of out there about it. They knew there was something that they were searching for. They didn't even know what they were searching for, but they knew that they needed to search for it. They're, they're prophesying about that grace that afterwards should be revealed. And that grace is what we have the luxury of being able to look yeah. into today. Amen. And that's what the gospel is. That's the good, that's the good news. That is the good news. Uh, it's, uh, you know, people say... And, oh, and all the shadows, all the things we see in, in Israel's history are shadows right. of the good things to come. Mm -hmm. they, they really are. Right. And they're just a shadow or an example and sample, mm -hmm. um, a pattern, mm -hmm. um, you know, a template if you would, yeah, right. and, you know, and all those things are. One one that we were talking about the other night, I don't know if I mentioned the last, I may have mentioned this last month, is, you know, circumcision is a cutting away of the flesh. Abraham was given the sign of circumcision, the seal of righteousness he had. That he already had, didn't he? Right. Yeah. Okay, now that's the, that's the, that's a, that's some type of pattern or shadow or example of something else that's coming up. Well, you know what it is? Paul says in Colossians chapter um, 2, it says um, in verse 11, In whom also you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands in putting off the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein you are also uh, also you are risen with him through faith the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead, and you being dead in your sins, and the uncircumcision of your flesh hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Abraham, that, that sign of circumcision was just a shadow of the circumcision made without hands in putting off the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. That's talking about exactly the same thing that we were talking about in Romans chapter 8, mortifying the deeds of the, fl uh, of the flesh. Ye shall live. There's uh, an example. Uh, there's the. I don't even want to say it's the, the the fulfillment of that example of Abraham, but it's a big part of it. Mm. And the last one, there's another. There's another. It's like an onion. You got a, a little bitty ball in the middle. You got a layer. You got a layer. Mm. You got a layer. What's going to happen in the end? God's going to cut off all flesh do away right. with all flesh and we're all going to become spirit he's going to cut all flesh away it says flesh and blood shall not inherit the kingdom of god nobody's going to be flesh in the end so it you know it's just an ex uh, example of one thing that's going to be an example of another thing and it just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger um so, you know that's how the bible works you can look back I there. have a question about flesh though since you said that yeah. What about it when in Ezekiel when he says he's going to take those dry bones and he's going to the raise them up? up and, yeah, he's going to raise them up and they're yeah, mm -hmm. and and they're going to be in their flesh. And then he's going to breathe his spirit mm -hmm. of life back into them and they're going to walk into the kingdom. So, when I think of flesh and blood, I don't know. I don't know what to do with that verse. Is all flesh the same kind of flesh? No. Right. 
I, that, I mean, that's the only thing I know to say about it. I'm not all, and you know, and I, I think whenever we get in, when it says flesh and blood shall not inherit the kingdom, I believe that we're going to have some type of body. I mean, obviously, right. what I understand well, we have about a house body, eternal in the heavens, if right? Paul says that that we shall be conformed into his. So, we have a oh, body fashioned body should, after his glorious yeah, body. Yeah, we shall have things. a body flat fashioned like unto his glorious body. Right, but that's a body. That you know, it, it, was he flesh? It's kind of a weird kind of flesh because yeah. he was eating with them. Yeah. Um, he still had the marks in his hands and the wound right. in his side, but he went straight through the door. He went right up to the third heaven. I don't right even know if that's down. his glorious body. I would say that's that was the way he appeared after he was resurrected, but. Don't we see other places where we see his hair, his, mm, his raiment like, was red, and know, his hair was this white, and his eyes were like fire? And, well, the only place you know, that, is that I his would glorified know to look, body? look at that is then. Revelation. Well, no, and that happens in the Gospels when Paul, uh, Peter and John go up to the mm -hmm. mountain, and they see his face shone like, like an angel. the sun. And, yeah, oh, yeah. You know, so do we get the idea of how our body's going to be based on that information? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I don't you know. know that's one. a good question yeah. because you know Peter says that. Um, I don't even know if I could find that verse. We but, know they walked through walls. You know, came through walls. Well, I mean, that's pretty glorious to be able to do yeah, those things. Yeah, it is. Anyhow. And to look like this and to go through the wall. Right. Yeah, yeah. To yeah. look like your flesh and, and to go through. And not. Yeah, even, I don't know. Not. I mean, not even just the wall though. I mean, he walked <laughs> straight through the rock to get out of the get out of the tomb. You know, whenever good he point. was resurrected. Good point. <laughs> Um, you know, going through a door is one thing. <laughs> I'm sure if I got going fast enough, I'd go through that door. I, but, you know, to go through that stone that wasn't rolled away, right. um, you know, that's a, that's a pretty tall order right mm -hmm. there. Um, let's see here. I don't know if I can find that. Okay, well, while you're looking, I was going to read a verse in Galatians. Uh, let's see if I can find it now. We were talking about law and legal. Actually... Um, we were talking about law, and I was going to read this part about faith. For in Christ, this is Galatians 5, 6, For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. And, you know, I think that's the whole point. You're saying your whole mind has to be changed. Um, I'm saying... It doesn't just happen. God, the Holy Spirit, doesn't do it apart from you being fed. You really need the Word of God to work in you. You know, His Spirit works through this book and, you know, uh, through the words on the page. The Apostle Paul says in Philippians 4, 8, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, Whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Those things which you've both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. And the reason I read that is because in order to have this change, this total change of mind, not being conformed with this world, but having a transformed mind comes from those things that's, that we learn and we've heard that we receive through the Apostle Paul, through those 13 books in the New Testament where he's teaching us what God is doing, the, the part that was hidden in Christ, mm -hmm. you know, in whom are, were all things hid. And they're no longer hidden. They're revealed on the pages of Paul's epistles and some actually, you know, you can see in Peter's writing that he was... Um, aware of these things too, but we need to have. But where do you we, get it? Where do you communica think? Communicating with Paul, probably, and I'm sure, and from Acts 10, he probably got some directly from God too. According, yeah, possibly I mean, did because he well, he didn't get it from Peter. He from didn't get sheet. it from Paul. Yeah, well, right. from that vision, right. <laughs> right, right. I would say Peter had some pretty direct um, revelations. I, and, you know, himself. I don't know. I don't know if after that that he had a whole lot of you know, lightning rod moments, yeah. but 
you know, that was probably the last substantial. That one. was big. That yeah. was big. Don't call unclean what I've called clean. Yeah, I mean, that was yeah. some pretty big information right well, there. Well, and I think he was preparing Peter to see that, hey, when I call Paul out to be the minister to the Gentiles, you know, the apostle to the Gentiles, you know, remember they, he gave Peter and James and John gave Paul the right hand of fellowship. You know, they when they perceived, what was it? When they perceived the uh, grace that he who was effectual in them was the same who was effectual in him. Let's see, Galatians 2, 7. But contrarywise, when they, that was Peter, James, and John, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter, for he that wrought effectually in Peter to his apostleship, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. And so, and when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship that we should go to the heathen and they unto the circumcision. So I think God was preparing Peter. And I even think of that verse, you know, where in Matthew, where Jesus says, those things that you have loosed mm -hmm. on earth will be loosed in heaven. Those things you've bound on earth. I, I kind of always felt like that right hand of fellowship was Peter acknowledging kind of a binding. Does that make sense? Right. Well, that's... Because yeah, Peter yeah. was God's man, and here, here Peter's being revealed now that, oh, God's doing something different through Paul. The, uh, it, it was uh, an authority, is basically. Yeah. What, and it's by his authority, I basically commissioned Paul, in a way, or... I, well, Peter not, didn't not, commission him, but Peter endorsed it endorsed or it. acknowledged it. Right. Sure, and, and you can clearly see that in Second Peter. It's like an endorsement. I don't sure. say commission, but, it, you know, I, this is my judgment that the, Paul is a man sure. of God. Listen to what he has to say. Yeah, in fact, I think Second Peter verse chapter 3, verse 15, um, he says, an account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, that, this grace period that we live in is salvation even as our beloved brother Paul also according to the wisdom given unto him hath written unto you as also in all his epistles speaking in them of these things in which uh, some things are hard to be understood which they that are unlearned and unstable rest or twist as they do also other scriptures unto their own destruction. I always thought that was a really amazing verse mm -hmm. that you can twist the scriptures to your own destruction. Right. That's an amazing verse. Well, that's, you know, that if you, that's the truth of it, because if you look in most of Paul's epistles, I mean, all, all the way through his epistles, I mean, um, what he's preaching against is pe people teaching false doctrine. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, Satan's ministers will be transformed into an, uh, ministers of light. Uh, um, if any man preacheth any other gospel, mm. let him be accursed. Mm. Um, in, in Romans uh, f uh, 15, uh, it says, um, uh, gain, let's see here. Those teaching gain, here's one in uh, 1 Timothy 6, 5, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness from such withdraw them thyself. And then I like the one in uh, 1 Timothy 6, 3, if any man teach otherwise, other than what Paul's teaching, mm -hmm. and consent not to wholesome words, the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words. Uh, in Romans chapter 16, now I beseech you, brother, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them that they yep. that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. Mm -hmm. But what are they preaching about? I mean, why would he have to put in there that they serve not our Lord Jesus Christ? Because they're going around talking about Christ in a way, right. but they're putting people under the law uh, or whatever. They serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. That's exactly the same thing that the Pharisees and the Sadducees were doing. They were standing on the street corners, uh, praying long prayers in their long robes and looking mm -hmm. so, you know, beautiful and fair. And uh, that's what, you know, that's, that's the theme um, basically, that's the New Testament theme. Uh, 
that's uh, in in uh, Acts chapter um, four. Um, Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, "Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel." Okay, who's he talking to? The rulers and the elders. Uh, verse ten. Let's see here. No, excuse me. Eleven. Verse eleven. This is the stone which was set at naught of who? You build you builders. He's talking, he's preaching at the builders, at the mm -hmm. teachers, at the preachers. Make sure that what you're preaching is according to truth and according to doctrine mm. and not what your heart conjures up because there's some pretty stern warnings in there about what you're doing if if you do these things the wrong way it's kind of an interesting thing here uh these guys peter's re, you know rebuking these builders uh what does paul say that he is he's a master builder he's the master mm -hmm, is. builder see that's where we find our information is through the apostle paul that's where we get basically the keys to unlock all the information in your Bible. If you're going to study the Old Testament, you do it in light of the 13 epistles that were given to the Apostle Paul because in there is the hidden wisdom. And it says that all, all hit wisdom of, uh, hidden wisdom of uh, the treasures and knowledge, what we read about mm -hmm. there in uh, Philippians, uh, or excuse me, in Colossians, mm -hmm. um, that's, how, that's how you're supposed to read your Bible. Uh, for 2 Timothy 2.15 Study of the show I self approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth. Right. Okay. Does that mean that you're dividing truth from error? No. You're dividing truth from truth. But what you're doing is you're seeing where the keys are at. You're going to find where the outline is and the outline basically is in Romans 2 Philemon. And then you can go back here and you can start putting stuff in. These were examples this is what the, the keys here this is the hidden wisdom about those examples i'll line everything up now yes everything yes. up with these books and if i you know consider it, what i say and, and the, the lord, lord give, give the, the understanding, understanding in exactly all things right. yeah um and yeah. you know he's a pattern for all them that should afterward be believe mm -hmm. uh, i'd like to thank you all for listening to us today sorry we didn't have any calls uh Please uh, call in or join us next time uh, for the Heaven or Hell broadcast. Thank you very much. Thank you.